Hello and welcome to our eighth annual Up for Debate weekend. Uh, TEDx Bishop's U is one of the culminating events that has seen a Donald lecture, a debate tournament, a case competition, uh, and tonight we will gather together and debrief and think about future plans together. So. I am absolutely thrilled to introduce my co-host today, Rebecca Masai, who is a Maple League Fellow of External Advocacy. She's from St. Francis Xavier, and Sally Cunningham, who is a Maple League Student Fellow of Research from Bishops University. Yay! <laughs> yeah. So the Maple League was founded as a consortium of hope. Hope defined by the philosopher Ira Shore as challenging the actual in the name of the possible. So together, the four institutions, Acadia, Bishops, Mount Allison, and St. Francis Xavier, are animated in their collaborations by two guiding questions. The first question is, what can we do together that we cannot do on our own? And the second one is, how do we enhance what we do do on our own campuses? Collaboration is absolutely at the key to really thinking carefully and critically about a quality undergraduate education in Canada. Today we're going to navigate together some contested conceptual terrains. You will hear about um, climate change and environmental sustainability. You'll hear about murdered and missing Indigenous women, about ways to decolonize our academy, about grappling with gendered violence and sexual assault, and a host of other topics. But at the heart of each one of these talks is hope, is actually challenging the actual in the name of the possible. So I hope when you leave today, you're not just inspired, but you're also moved to action. In the words of Paulo Freire, who wrote The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he said, to hope alone is to hope in vain. Hope must be anchored in practice. And so the eight speakers today, drawn from our very talented pool of students, faculty, and administrative leaders, will all demonstrate how they anchor hope in practice through their various disciplinary and leadership lenses. I'm thrilled to be able to share this afternoon with you, um, and I hope that we together can ask those guiding questions to be better than we are. So, Rebecca is going to do a Maple League land acknowledgement. The Maple League of Universities are built on the lands of Indigenous peoples. The Abenaki people and the Wabanaki Confederacy at Bishops University, the Mi'kmaq and Wolostokwe peoples at Acadia, Mount Allison, and St. Francis Xavier Universities. These peoples are the traditional stewards and protectors of the territories. In our institutions, we value indigenous ways of knowing and honor the hard work ahead of us with truth, reconciliation, and, ind and justice with indigenous peoples. All right. Um, starting us off today in our talks is Rena Atanasiadis, and she's the Dean of the Williams School of Business here at Bishops University. Um, she brings over two decades of wealth management and finance experience to the classroom. Her areas of academic interest include behavior of finance, corporate finance, portfolio management, and financial institutions management. So please welcome to the stage, Dean Rena. Good afternoon. There's not a day that goes by that you turn on the TV and watch the news and see something about climate change. And the images that we see are getting progressively worse. We notice that there is increased flooding, that in fact the strength of the hurricanes that are affecting our planet are increasing, that our oceans are getting more and more acidic, and it's killing the wildlife. It's causing the Great Barrier Reef, parts of it, to die. Now, it's interesting that we've come to this place after 50 years of scientists, biologists warning us. Why is it that we are now, after 50 years of warning, you would think with such a long runway, we'd do something about it? What is it specifically about humanity that we didn't stop, pay attention, and fix this problem. This is what this TED Talk is going to try to explain. I am going to let you into the mind of the human being. We're all going to do it together. And I'm going to provide you with some answers. It's not enough to just say, we're typically human, we procrastinate, we don't take care of problems. 
I'm actually going to show you what neuroscience is indicating and why it is that we're here today. So about 50 years ago, a biologist came out and tried to explain to humanity what was going to happen. It was very predictive. He saw the warning signs. And in his mind, he wanted to simplify the science so that the rest of us would understand. Now, he called this a tragedy, so I'm warning you, spoiler alert, all the sheep are going to die. But he called it the tragedy of the commons, and the story is very simple, because he wanted to illustrate a, a principle that we've taken for granted for more than a century. The story goes like this. Imagine that you live in a village, and just outside the village, there's a grassy knoll. Beautiful grass is growing, and you imagine that you could own a couple of sheep, let them graze, collect the wool, sell the milk, and your financial con condition will improve. So you do that. Of course, your neighbor now notices that you're improving in life, and they too go out and buy a couple of sheep and let them graze on the same piece of land. By the end of this tragedy, the entire village has done the same thing. But now the earth beneath the grass is tired, can no longer grow the grass to support all the sheep. So all the sheep die. The end. Now, the scientist who came up with this story was a fellow by the name of Garrett Harding, and he wrote this back in 1968. And it contains a few lessons. The first thing is, who did the land belong to, really? It was nobody's. Therefore, was it everybody's? The fact that we could just use this land causes some questions to be raised. OK, what else? The fact that we as individuals were profiting from this land, and by the way, the use of the word individual could also mean companies, firms. The fact that we were able to profit without accounting for the use is also something that we need to question. Ultimately, what happens if the individual is put before that of the good of the common, well, then the common purse has to pay for it at the end. And that's where we are now. Now, when Garrett Harding created this tragedy of the commons, he specifically forecasted that this was going to happen. It was predictive. And he made it very simple for the rest of us to understand, because he said, think of all the resources on Earth. It's a finite supply of these resources. If we keep growing our population at some point, the math won't add up. Very simple to understand. And with 50 years' notice, you'd think that today we wouldn't be facing a climate crisis. Now, compare that message with another environmentalist, Greta. What she says about the climate and about the, about the condition of our Earth is pretty much the same as what Garrett was saying 50 years ago. But look at how she puts it. She says, I've stopped going to school, because school prepares you for the future. And I don't think there is a future for my generation. Now, that message has one fundamental difference, and that is, it is in the present. It is an absolute red flag that it's happening right now compared to Garrett Harding's message, which was, hey, it's coming. It's in the future. So if Greta's sounding the same alarm, and we had 50 years, can we just walk away saying, well, it's all our fault. You know, humans, procrastination, it's part of our charm. What are you going to do about it? I know for a fact that when I give out assignments with a two-week deadline, most students will not start right away. They're going to wait a couple of weeks, and the night before, everybody's pretty busy. Doesn't that explain why we're in this situation? Well, not quite. Here's why. Because those of us who study behavior want to know why is it exactly that we behave the way we do. And what makes us typically human is this thing called the brain that we all carry. Now, when we talk about the brain, we kind of think that it's this three-pound gray jelly thing that we have between our ears. But in fact, the brain is broken down into three very distinct areas. 
Let me start by explaining the most important part for the human function, and that is something called the reptilian complex. Just like the name suggests, it's the oldest part of the brain, and what it does, it controls your body. You don't wake up in the morning and schedule breathing or swallowing your saliva. You just do it. If you don't swallow your saliva, you're going to drown in your own mouth. It's the kind of thing that you take for granted. You go outside, and it's cold, you shiver. It's an instinct for you to put on a coat. Therefore, the reptilian part of your brain is that which makes sure that you as a human have the best chance of survival. Okay, what's the next part? Now, this part of the real estate I really like because it controls memory and emotion. And those two go hand in hand. Think about you having a memory that was caused by a strong emotion. Not only does your brain remember it more, it's because the chemistry that goes along with your brain, all those chemicals that slush around our body, fuse it. So when we have a memory, we can go back to it, and that helps us in our everyday decision making. Here's what I want to tell you about the limbic system. That is so underestimated as to how much our daily decision making rests on what we remember, our memory. We're going to be doing a couple of experiments in a couple of minutes, and you're going to see just what I mean. The last part of the brain is the neocortex. Now, this is a relatively new piece that we've kind of, you know, in evolutionary terms, it's only about 50,000 years that we have it. And what it does, think of it like the human simulator. It actually allows us to know that there's a future, that there is a time continuum. And when we're trying to figure out what to do, in the future, then we can decide under uncertainty. That's what the neocortex does. So all together, the brain assists us in making decisions. And don't forget, the limbic and reptilian parts of the brain are very quick. They have the habit of coming up and giving you support so that you could do your daily you know, routine without having to stop and think. But when you have a more complex problem, your neocortex jumps in. Okay, so here we are. Um, assuming we all have a brain that's ready to go, let's give it a little run, and we're going to start with our first experiment. Nobody gets hurt. Your skull will not be opened. What we will do very simply is follow the instructions on the screen. So I'm just going to give you the instruction, and you try to do it. Okay? We are going to be testing the reptilian part of the brain by not blinking. Stop blinking. Keep your eyes open. Don't blink. Hold on. Don't blink. You're all looking a lot like this guy. <laughs> and some of you have already blinked because you thought about what you had for breakfast this morning. So what have we learned? How do you stop blinking? It's an override, right? It's like control that you take over this hardwired thing that you do. You blink because otherwise your eyes dried out, and that's not a good thing. So can we override the reptilian part of our brain? Absolutely. Is it hard? Can we sustain it? Absolutely not. OK, we learned something. The next part of the brain is the limbic area. And that I mentioned to you just before, that it's where the memories and the emotions live. Now, let me give you two examples of how important memory and emotion are. We know that if we, well, how many of you have a cat here that got too close to a radiator or a stove, right? That happens once, because a cat has a limbic area as well. And the experience of getting burned gets fused into the cat's brain. They're never going to get that close again. Same thing with us. Now, what's interesting about the other part, or the other role of the limbic brain, is that it contains all our memories. Now, you underestimate just how much we rely on memory. If I ask you, what is 2 plus 2? You don't sit there going, OK, I got this. You start with 2, and I put 2 more of whatever, and it's 4. You actually instantly say 2. That's pretty easy. Let's go to something a little bit more difficult, like reading. 
Are you reading at the speed that you are used to? Are you actually deciphering? Or do you see the word and you've memorized what it is? That's why you could read at the speed that you're reading. Think about hundreds, thousands of words that you instantly recognize. Let me go even more complicated. How many of you have talked on the phone while you're driving? On hands-free, of course. And you get to where it is you're going. And then you look back and go, how the heck did I get here? You don't remember how you got there. Why? I mean, autopilot kicked in. And think about the complexity of driving. Just making a left turn on Queen Street is enough to scare us, right? And what you're doing is allowing that memory system, the limbic area, to drive your car. See how evolved the limbic area can be, just based on habit memory. OK, finally, let's test our prefrontal area. This again, I'm going to put up an instruction. And I want you to do two things at the same time. Try to follow the instruction, and then try to note why you're failing at doing what I'm asking you to do. Good? Ready? OK, so there's a couple of giggles. I guess it's because you read the word mother. And your limbic area immediately did what? A thought of your mother came in. But then the neocortex says, ha, ah, the instruction is don't think about your mother. So now you're forced to think about the cookie monster or something, just to get rid of your mother out of your mind. So what happens with the neocortex is that you engage it. You override the fast part of the brain, which is ultimately the reptilian or the limbic area only if you have self-control. OK, so we learned something. And we know that all of the brain works together, that the reptilian part and the limbic part is the fast part of the brain, doesn't consume a lot of energy, versus the prefrontal area does take up a lot of energy, but it's there for us to solve complex problems and decisions that affect us in the future. So it's interesting to say that the way the brain is structured perhaps is the reason why we haven't dealt with climate change. This is a piece of research that was done by four neuroscientists. And after you've sat through the fastest neuroscience lesson on Earth about a minute ago, I'm about to show you what they discovered, which is pretty astonishing. The first thing they did was take a volunteer. OK, it wasn't a volunteer, it was a student. And they put him into an MRI machine. And what they did is ask them a simple question. How are you feeling now? Are you hungry? Are you cold? And that student or that volunteer basically said, no, I'm doing fine. I'm not hungry. I'm not cold. And they tracked the brain activity that was being generated by the MRI machine. All right, we see that right here. Top white line, most dominant line in terms of score, and it indicates activity in those two areas, the limbic and the reptilian part of the brain. Then they ask this student a follow-up question. Where do you think of going for your summer holiday in June? Now that student is thinking, hmm, maybe I can go back to California or maybe to Europe to visit family. Now what's happening? The prefrontal area is doing what-if scenarios, simulations. And we track that activity with the green line or the second line. Third follow-up question was, now tell me, who is your best friend? Ah, I don't know, Joe. OK. What do you think Joe is doing right now? Well, it's Saturday around 2.30. I don't know what Joe does, right? Again. You are thinking not about yourself this time, but about something happening in the present. And once again, we tracked the brain activity. Last question, where do you think Joe wants to go in June of next year for holidays? And once again, you had to use your prefrontal cortex in order to figure that out. Now, when you look at this, you can't walk away without concluding 
something pretty astonishing. This is how your brain works. Whether you're talking about a stranger now, or a friend now, or a friend later in the future, or yourself in the future, your brain f processes the information the same way. In fact, what this says is that your brain sees you now as a different person than you in the future. So 50 years ago, when we had the heads up, do something about the planet, help it heal, what were we saying was, act now, exercise self-control. And we didn't quite do that, did we? Because we were behaving the way every human does, taking care of today, relying on our limbic area mostly to make decisions, as opposed to exercising self-control, overriding our habits, and contributing to a healthier planet. So I didn't solve any problem here today about the climate change issue, but hopefully you've gotten some more insight as to how we got here. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Maxim Jacques. He is a final year business student at Bishop's University, majoring in global management and leadership. Born and raised in Thetford Mines, Quebec, he chose to come to Bishop's for its tight-knit community and because he wanted to have an impact on campus. Since his first year, he has been involved in the Bishop's University Commerce Society, where he currently acts as the Vice President Internal. Maxim intends to pursue a master's degree in sustainable development that will lead him to become an environmental leader and give him the tools necessary to find solutions to the climate crisis. Please help me in welcoming Maxim. people you shared it with. Chances are you do, and I bet it happened outside the classroom. I bet it was an experience where you put your hands in the dirt, or you tried something new, perhaps made a mistake, but learned a valuable lesson out of it. Or just like me, you went on the field out there to learn more. If I'm here today, it's because through my experiential learning, I made the conclusion that we students have a role to play in fighting the most pressing issue that challenges our very existence. This issue is climate change. Now, I'm a business student, and in our classes, we rarely discuss the topic of the climate crisis. But strangely, corporations are the ones who have the power to change society. Instead, we still teach the neoclassical view of profits, performance, and unlimited use of resources. If we don't teach sustainable development right now, to the next generation of leader. And if we don't make it a mandatory subject, the future of our planet will be dire. Now, you might be surprised if I were to tell you that I didn't know anything about climate change 10 months ago, and that tackling it was not on my career plan at all. When I started my bachelor's, I was only concerned about creating my own company and making enough money to never have the same financial issues my parents had when I was young. Most students have an idea, or at least, a blurry one, of what they want to do with their lives once they graduate. But if they have the chance to go through novel experiences, they might just discover new passions and redefine their interests. And this is exactly what happened to me. The liberal education framework at Bishop's University, <laughs> the liberal education framework at Bishop's University gave me the chance to go out there on the field to see what things look like. And so today I'll tell you about this transformational learning experience and argue that to live such radical shifts in mindsets, we need three elements. First, we need the ability and the opportunity to go through those transformational learning experiences. Then we need to develop emotional intelligence and cultural competence. And third, we need to provide students 
with a curriculum that helps them to be prepared to tackle the climate change challenge. So let me tell you about this experience. Um, it started with traveling a few months ago. So last April, I was awarded the Bishop's Exceptional Student Talent Project Fund. This initiative aims to give students the ability to define their career paths and to realize their ambitions through the completion of a personal project. Following a research that I did on sustainability, I enrolled in the Green Program to discover more about the topic and to explore my passion about sustainable development. The Green Program is a 10-day experience that aims to provide a purposeful hands-on industry exposure to young leaders in sustainable development. The Green Program is the perfect example of redefined education. It mixes in-class learning to field trips and creates a dynamic learning environment to build a student's awareness to global sustainability issues. The Green Program offers this dis learning in four different destinations, and I chose the one that takes place in Cusco, in Peru, to learn about water resource management and sustainable development. So the first, the first component of the program is in-class lectures. So we were first provided with a thorough background on Peru's culture and history to understand how the country ended up in their current political situation and where do their techniques and technologies come from, largely from indigenous peoples. Then we look at Peru's geography and hydrography to understand what the resources, what, which resources they have right now and what are the current issues they have to deal with. In this case, drinkable water. Finally, we look at climate change and sustainable development. The biggest part, the biggest chunk of what we were taught during those 10 days. And the World Commission on Environment and Development defines sustainability as meeting the, need of the meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability to meet the needs of future generations. And quite simply, this means don't destroy the planet by using all the resources it provides. When I was in Peru, I realized one thing, is, and it's that as leaders, we need to build on sustainable development to solve global world issues. We're talking here about poverty, hunger, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, and affordable and clean energy. In other words, as leaders, we must seek to reach the sustainable development goals that were defined by the United Nations. Going back to Peru, we also did some field trips. So we visited a hydropower plant, a wastewater treatment facility, and a local producer of alpaca wool clothes where we were explained the production process. Peru has a rich culture, history, food, music, and so I had the chance to go through an immer a cultural immersion by visiting amazing sites, such as the Sacred Valley of Tipon, and of course Machu Picchu, where we learn about indigenous practices and the role of indigenous peoples in shaping the, the country's traditions, customs, and current way of living. Traveling opens your mind because you become curious and you want to explore more. This curiosity is an asset because it develops a genuine sense of caring about people and wanting to learn more about them. And th those are two key attitudes to have in today's global workplace. Traveling also opens your mind to the extent of social issues. So we're talking about poverty, the effects of climate change on populations at risk, and water, food, water and food scarcity, and indigenous rights and knowledge. The last component of, a, of the program is the development of a capstone project. So we were tasked with the creation of a business initiative to help reach the UN's SDGs. So in a group of three, we came up with a small scale solution of a pumped hydro energy storage system. And how this works is basically built on hydro energy. And you have two reservoirs that are located at different altitude. So the lower one, when there's a low demand for energy, will pump the water up there and store it in the high reservoir. And when there's higher demand for energy, we bring the water back down to generate electricity out of it. And so this solution could reduce reliance on fossil fuels by coupling it with uh, other sources of renewable energies. And we're talking here about solar or wind power. And it will also increase resiliency in case of natural disasters. On top of gaining a comprehensive understanding of key concepts covered in class, going out there on the field really helped me to see and understand how people live and work every day. By combining in-class knowledge with interactions with industry experts and to a capstone project, it facilitates learning retention. I strongly believe that 
those kind of hands-on experiences and challenging yourself to go out of your comfort zone is the best way to learn, especially when it comes to climate change. My trip in Peru being a great example of it. And so those kind of experiences help students build two essential skills that any leader should possess to be able to face any situation. And we're talking here about cultural competence and emotional talent. Both competencies help students to understand how climate change affects people. And it fosters the development of a genuine sense of responsibility and accountability. So looking at the cultural competence is learning about the culture, going through this cultural immersion, learning about values, norms, beliefs, and interacting with people with, uh, of, the, of the other cultures while knowing how your own culture affects how you perceive the behaviors of others. Emotional intelligence on its side is described as identifying and understanding and successfully managing the emotions of ourselves and others. The most, dimension of, the most important dimension of emotional intelligence to me is empathy. Being able to put yourselves in the shoes of others and looking at their points of views without being judgmental. It's the willingness to look at someone else's perspective without comp compromising your own identity. And so the, another, dimension that is the, another dimension that is developed uh, by experiential learning is self-awareness. Because by going through these experiences, you learn so much about yourself that you know when to ask for help. By going out there and knowing about your strengths and your limitations, I learned that when you know those, you can still be the leader of a team even when you're not the smartest one in the room. Now, those kind of experiences can be developed uh, pretty easily. So at Bishop's University, we do a lot to give students with the tools to learn emotional intelligence and cultural competence, and also to help them find their purpose. And this is true for all members of the Maple Leaf Universities. And so we have such close relationships with teachers and faculty that they know us and they know what we need to learn and transform. They're so engaged that they're often the ones who are encouraging us to take a risk and on the other side, we also had a chance to learn beyond the classroom, um, for example, in the, com in, the, in the business school, by learning beyond the commerce society, by doing case competitions, like today, uh, also by having large projects with local firms, and finally, by, having, by, by going to other firms and visiting their facilities. On top of this, we also have the alumni network, which is very large, and former students still call this university their home, so it's very easy for students to find, to find employment after graduation. But we can do more. And to do this, we need to educate students on sustainable development and how they can play a role in fighting issues. So here's what we can do. Well, first of all, we need to improve our curriculum uh, and by creating more opportunities for experiential learning. We need to provide students with the tools to be able to fight the environmental crisis. So a few examples of what we can do will be to first include core classes on, cl on global issues in the business school by teaching, for example, climate change, waste management, renewable energies, indigenous rights, and then we need to give students the tools to deal with issues by teaching circular economy, sustainable development, waste reduction, integration of renewable energies in business and sustainable finance. By making sure that all of those balance equally the environment and society. Going further, we, we could connect students with groups that are affected by climate change and also with groups that are finding uh, solutions to reach sustainable development. We're talking here, uh, for example, about about small organic producers, environmental NGOs, environmental policy makers, and indigenous people. So by connecting students with those groups, they'll be able to identify which issues they will be facing in the future and find solutions to those issues. By doing this, it also helps avoid the common situation of a box-ticking approach to corporate social responsibility. This solution can integrate students from all disciplines as either cognitive, and interpersonal competence. When I was in Peru, 
um, I realized that interdisciplinary was a key success factor in preparing our case. Among all the students on the program, I was the only student in blue. My other teammates were either studying environmental sciences or renewable energies. By combining our skills and different disciplinary out different discipline outlooks, we got a 360 view of our solution and a new perspective that students with different academic backgrounds would have never had. So teaching issues that are related to climate change require, require different fields of expertise, and we should incorporate this in the current curriculum. And so, by having the chance to go through transformational learning experiences, by building the students' cultural competence and emotional intelligence, and by improving our curriculum with them, we can build a better future. Experiential learning reshapes your vision, your values, and your world. He is a CPA CA who is passionate about the place where accounting and social impact meet. He's currently a tenure track professor in accountancy at Acadia University's Manning School of Business, and he brings over 15 years of leadership experience across public, private, and third sector organizations to the classroom. So please welcome Mike Kennedy. Our world is currently being gripped by a paralyzing pandemic. It causes anxiety, depression, and an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. And we're not talking about it nearly enough. It's time that we talked about arithmophobia. <laughs> arithmophobia, the morbid fear of numbers. There has arguably never been a time where this devastating disease has been more widespread, and we need to talk about it. Now, I don't know many of you very well, but this feels like a safe space, and uh, I'm hoping that today I can open up to you about some of the numbers that strike fear into my heart each and every day. 2.5. 2.5 billion dollars a day is what Oxfam estimates that the wealth of the world's billionaires grew per day from 2017 to 2018. If we contrast this with the fact that about half of the world's population lives on an annual, or sorry, a daily income of $5.50, well below the poverty line, it's clear that wealth inequality is growing at an alarming rate. 286, terrified of this number also, small but mighty, 286 billion tons is what NASA estimates from 1993 to 2016 was the annual loss of glacial ice in Greenland on their, on their glaciers. So our climate is changing at a rapid rate and we're all starting to feel the effects. 5,000 terrifies me. Facebook owns over 5,000 data points on each of its billion plus users, from our age and basic demographic information through to analyzing our information in order to infer our political uh, leanings and our purchasing habits. This is leading to a rise in surveillance capitalism where our data is being commodified at an alarming rate and potentially being used against us. Our privacy is eroding absolutely rapidly. 
58,164,320. Also scared of this number? This is what PwC estimates will be the job loss due to artificial intelligence and automation in the U.S. alone by the year 2030. Arithmophobia is real, and it's time that we talked about it. Luckily, I believe that there is a hero waiting in the wings to help us tackle this crushing and devastating disease. A maven of mathematics, a sage of statistics, Someone who gets out of bed every day with the mission to serve and protect the public. Yes, everyone, of course, I am talking about <laughs> accountants. Some heroes wear capes, others carry calculators. <laughs> Hear me out. So since the modern incarnation of accounting was invented in the 15th century by Luca Pazzioli in Italy, we've referred to accounting as the language of business. It helps us keep score. It tells us whether, a co whether a company's making profit, what it owns, what it owes. It's the, the language that we use to measure business success. We're going to talk about a little bit more about this in a moment, but accounting actually has also uh, important language implications on your love life. So... According to this German-English dictionary produced by The Lonely Planet, um, if you're involved in a uh, romantic pursuit uh, by someone that maybe you're not interested in, don't worry, accounting can help. You're traveling, someone's expressing uh, that they're enamored with you, and you want to kind of let them down gently, simply utter the phrase, before this goes any further, I must be upfront. I'm an accountant. Accounting is the language of heartbreak. <laughs> I digress. So for the past 10 years, I've been a chartered professional accountant or CPA. And for the last four years, I've had the opportunity to teach the next generation of uh, CPAs or accountants at Acadia University. I fundamentally believe that accounting has the power to change lives. We can use it to measure the impacts we're having on the world around us, to effectively measure risk and opportunity, uh, and to tell a story about uh, how the organization that we're uh, working at is doing. For better or worse, the rules and the language we use around accounting fundamentally shape our society. With that said, I'm deeply concerned that if accounting is the language of business, we're not telling the whole story. Given the complex challenges that we face uh, as a society, I see a deep divide between the language that we're using uh, to illustrate business success and the complex challenges that we face, such as climate change or wealth inequality. So today I'd like to break down some of that language barrier uh, and propose uh, some steps that we can take uh, to immerse ourselves in a new language. So first exhibit, revenue minus expenses equals profit. This is probably the first thing you learn when you walk into an accounting class. Uh, it's the basis of the income statement. What we earn, less what we burn, is what's left over, and we want to maximize that bottom line, that profit line item. You might call it net income, and our objective is to maximize shareholder wealth through generating profit. This is drilled into our heads from day one if we're going through a modern business education. Okay. Exhibit number two. The fundamental accounting equation. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. If you were going to get one accounting tattoo, this is the one. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. <laughs> I haven't been able to convince any of my students to take me up on, uh, on that yet, but uh, who knows. So this is important. It tells us uh, that what we own as an organization is equal to uh, what we owe and what we get to keep. What isn't being told in this conversation or in this uh, language or equation is that all the entity really cares about is itself. It's focused on a single entity, and it doesn't much care for the positive or negative externalities it's, it's causing in the community or the globe around it. So accounting can be selfish. And the third relic I'd like to point out, uh, created in 1937 to the ultimate measure of an economy or country's success that we still rely on today, GDP or gross domestic product. The ultimate measure of success of an economy continues to be growth. So we add up our consumer spending, our government spending, our investment, uh, and then our net exports, and that's going to tell us whether our country is succeeding or not. We're addicted to an e economic growth, 
and have a tough time breaking out of the past. I can think of a few other things that have changed since 1937. Uh, maybe it's time we updated our language uh, a little bit uh, to reflect that. Okay. So language is important. And the language that we're currently using is leading to a race to the bottom line, a single entity focus that's not concerned about the externalities that it's creating, uh, and an addiction to growth. All of these combined are creating uh, a significant rise in wealth and income inequality, uh, tremendous impacts on our planet, and giving up our privacy data at an alarming rate and having it used against us. So today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we can create a new language immersion program that's taking a more holistic view of accounting from day one in our curriculum. And I think the Maple League of Institutions is perfectly positioned to do that given our natural inclination to be interdisciplinary system thinkers. So this is Acadia University. Uh, a few years ago I studied there, um, studied accounting, and it was where I was introduced to concepts such as business, uh, profit, but also uh, complex systems, sustainability, and externalities. I had a few silo-smashing professors that really changed my conception of what a business should be, far beyond a purveyor of wealth generation for shareholders. Uh, it's also an actor in a complex system, and its actions have a tremendous impact on the ecosystem around it. Unfortunately, those conversations were limited to uh, several isolated classes, rarely touched on accounting or finance-related courses, and in the 20 years uh, uh, approximately since I've graduated, it came up in the conversation far too uh, little uh, throughout my career. Okay. So I believe it's incumbent upon us to create a new immersion uh, into a, a bigger language, and I have a few turbo-tangible ideas that I think we can uh, tackle within the next year that I'd like to share with you and hopefully chat with about you uh, later in the week or the weekend rather. So first, starting small. So I'm a complex systems scholar and an accountant. What a combo, I'm a hit at parties. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about the parts of a system, uh, how they interact with other parts, and how that impacts the system uh, as a whole. So a core tenant of that, uh, a central pillar, if you will, is that of path dependence. Um, other scholars uh, would refer to it something similar, maybe uh, historical institutionalism. Both are incredibly pretentious ways of saying that uh, you'd rarely get a second chance to make a first impression, um, and it's tough to teach an old dog new tricks. So um, when it comes to accounting, when the first thing we hear is that uh, revenue minus expenses equal profit, and we've got to maximize shareholder wealth, it gives us a limiting view of what accounting could and uh, arguably should be. So I would argue that from day one, when we introduce accounting, it's got to be in a holistic manner, uh, where we're introducing uh, triple bottom line accounting, where people, uh, the planet, and profit are all presented as equally important and uh, an important uh, equation to balance um, uh, when it comes to uh, business and broader society. So seeing this emerge through trends towards uh, ESG reporting um, in Europe, and we'll inevitably see that happening here, we've got to equip our students with, uh, with a new language uh, to tackle that. So I would challenge any of my colleagues, particularly those who teach in accounting or finance, that to, to sprinkle in a little bit of triple bottom line thinking in the first class early on and throughout their accounting uh, curriculum before they dive into the BS, the balance sheet. Huh? <laughs> okay, second, thank you, thank you for, uh, the, uh, thank you for that. So second, thinking a little bit bigger, um, last year uh, we had tremendous, uh, tremendous pilot of a course throughout the Maple League where we brought together professors from different disciplines and they looked at the concept of time from the perspectives of uh, religion, uh, biology, music, and uh, physics. So I would love to take this uh, concept, interdisciplinary learning, and create a course that looked at measuring impact. We could feature uh, books from sociology, from business, from religion, uh, community development, dive into things like Sustain the UN's Sustainable Development Goals and develop a deep understanding of them, look at things like social return on investment. Um, you may have noted that I left physics deliberately uh, out of this conversation because I thought sort of physics and impact, if there's one number that scares me, it's 9.8 meters per second squared. <laughs> could be fun, could be fun, okay? I think, uh, I think uh, within this, uh, there's a huge opportunity to make tangible steps towards uh, some of our, our uh, recommended actions under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and 
Um, that could take the form of, of incorporating new ways of knowing into our curriculum. Um, we've got to take tangible action here. We're all treaty people, and we're not doing nearly uh, enough. We've got to have uh, uh, that new knowledge uh, and new ways of knowing, um, or alternate ways of knowing, in deeply embedded into our curriculum. Okay. So the third, what if we took a holistic approach to how we did like our annual reporting and some of our strategic planning as a uh, as a university? So. Um, we could steal a page from the book of uh, Fogo Island in Newfoundland, which uses an economic nutrition label, a uh, relatively simple to understand way of uh, taking something we're familiar with and applying it to uh, financial decision making and reporting. Um, gives us a really clear picture of where the inputs to our institutions are coming from uh, and where the profits are being redeployed. So I think this would be particularly uh, interesting if we were to take it and apply it to procurement at universities and particularly that of uh, food services. Our current model of uh, uh, trying to achieve a low-cost um, food system in partnership with a, with a major corporation uh, results in uh, importing a ton of food and exporting a ton of profit beyond our regions. If we use this as a model for how we make uh, food procurement decisions on our universities, for example, um, we would be able to uh, or would likely gravitate towards working more closely with local producers to uh, have uh, an, an externality effect of bolstering our local food system um, and resilience within our local agriculture community and getting tastier things to eat. I would look amazing uh, when I go to government the next time to ask for funding if I'm able to demonstrate tangibly that I've made a fundamental impact on food system resilience uh, in the community that's around us. So, and we're small enough at uh, the Maple League of Institutions that we could uh, uh, make a serious dent in this. Okay. My final recommendation is that we should develop a strategic partnership with the Prince of Wales uh, Accounting for Sustainability Initiative, or A4S. This is relatively new, and it's aiming to change fundamentally the way that we uh, uh, develop our finance and accounting professionals in the world um, from day one, uh, teaching them to incorporate uh, themes of social and uh, environmental uh, risk management um, and accounting into uh, how we present financial information. So as a small school, it's interdisciplinary in nature. This could be a key differentiator at an early stage in a project that I think is going to change the accounting world. And so rather than um, using our limited resources to uh, compete with uh, institutions that are trying to pop people onto Bay Street and Wall Street, um, we think a little bit different, leverage our strength as systems thinkers um, to produce more holistic leaders uh, that, that understand kind of the big picture. So. Just a couple of ideas. Um, I think that uh, we're, we're really well positioned as like a system uh, of learners to make some fundamental changes in terms of uh, the language that we use. Uh, and if we were uh, able to bring a more holistic view to how we do accounting, um, I don't think those numbers would continue to be so scary. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Lara Hartman. Lara is a third year political science student at Acadia University. Lara is an indigenous woman from Fraser Lake, British Columbia, and grew up alongside the Highway of Tears, where a, long, where a large number of indigenous women and girls go missing as part of an ongoing genocide. Growing up learning about this, Lara became very interested in the topic and has helped to organize campus community, Sisters in Spirit events during her time at Acadia. She hopes to plan a moose hide campaign event at Acadia in February to raise awareness for violence against women and children, and then helps with the Sister in Spirit event for next October. Lara aims to raise awareness about this problem and about making positive changes for the ongoing future. Please help me in welcoming Lara. Thank you. Patricia Carpenter. Brooklyn Moose. Tina Fontaine. Gloria Moody. Monica Jack. Ashley Mashisnik, Verna Samard, Tabitha Kalik, 
Cheryl Johnson. These are just nine names that I could have chosen from a list of thousands. These are just nine of the indigenous women and girls who have gone missing or have been murdered as part of the genocide that is impacting our country. Indigenous women and girls are disproportionately impacted by all forms of violence. This problem, it's not specific. It impacts First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. This is a national crisis. The RCMP have only confirmed just under 2,000 Indigenous women and girls that have gone missing or have been murdered. Other research, though, points to the number being closer to 4,000. The RCMP only have reports on the Indigenous women nation, as the assimilation practices made people not want to claim their culture, for if they did, there were negative repercussions. Take, for instance, that from 1980 to 2012, Indigenous women made up 16% of all female homicides in Canada, while being only 4% of the female population. Approximately 2,500 Indigenous peoples were murdered from 1982 to 2011. Of that 2,500, 1,750 were male. 745 were female, and a further 105 Indigenous women were listed as missing for at least 30 days when the reasons for them going missing was deemed unknown or there was foul play suspected. Now, Canada, we, deem, we, tell, we tell ourselves we're like a moral leader of the, the countries in the world, but we've done some pretty ugly things. We like to wear blinders so we don't see the negative things in our history. But wearing blinders, it doesn't help us. Being willfully blind to the negativity is a hindrance. Take, for instance, that during the time of Indian residential schools, the settlers made it their duty to colonize the indigenous populations of Canada from coast to coast to coast to fit into the ways of a settler lifestyle. Now, the indigenous children went to these schools and learned the ways of a settler life, and slowly, over time, they began to pick up <clears throat> settler ways and lost touch of their own identities. Eventually, over time, the indigenous cultures faded away. Oftentimes, even those who are survivors are still struggling to find ways to get through the atrocities. They're living through this, and this can be described with the seventh generation principle. This principle is based on an ancient Iroquois philosophy that the decisions we make today should result in a, in a sustainable world seven generations into the future. Residential schools are still pretty recent in the history of Canada, which means we're still in the first few generations of this intergenerational trauma. To put this in perspective, the last residential school closed in 1996. I was born in 1999. Intergenerational trauma is what the seventh generation principle is all about. This trauma is defined as a cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across lifespans and over generations. A harm done to one group will carry onto the shoulders of their descendants. The trauma from residential schools is still impacting people in Canada. As Margaret Fenton and jo Jordan Fenton say in their book Fatty Legs, today the healing continues as the survivors, their children, and their children's children struggle to shed the shame of oppression and work towards reclaiming pride in their identities. Now, this is all forms of structural violence, both residential schools and this ongoing crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous peoples. Structural violence is a form of violence wherein a social structure or social institution make cause harm to individuals by not allowing them to meet their own basic needs. We need to deconstruct both residential schools and missing and murdered indigenous peoples and hopes of making things better for the future. For me, I grew up in BC, in Fraser Lake. Fraser Lake's located along the Highway of Tears. Now, I know at home this means a lot to people, and I'm sure a lot of you know what it is as well, but for those of you who don't know, the Highway of Tears is a stretch of Highway 16 in British Columbia. This part of the highway runs from Prince George to Prince Rupert, which covers 724 kilometers. Along this stretch of highway, many women, mainly Indigenous women, have gone missing or have been murdered. These women add to the statistics of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Now, like I said, 
I'm from BC. You might be thinking that Acadia is a bit of a stretch and why didn't I stay closer to home to go to school? Well, trust me, I get asked that question all the time. There was something about Acadia that drew me in and made me really want to go there. Being a small liberal arts institution, schools like ours in the Maple League can offer so much more to students. Not only was the size of the school nice for me as I came from a small high school, but the ability to form relationships has been an amazing bonus. Not only have I formed relationships with other students, but also with professors and community members. I feel like I have a family in Wolfville, and I couldn't have formed relationships like that anywhere else. Even though it's been hard at times, going to Acadia is the best decision that I could have made. Now, in terms of the national crisis, the Maple League is in an interesting spot. We're able to work together to make changes to make things better. And when we work together, we're able to lean on each other and make these changes faster. We say we want reconciliation, and if we're serious, we need to do something about it. Indigenous issues are at the forefront of many of the issues, not only in Canada, but in our League of Four Universities. Now, when it comes to making changes, this is a call to action. This is my call to action. And these are things that I think our institutions need to do if we're serious about change, and they need to happen within the next five years. But this is only a start. We need to have flags flying on all of our four institutions to celebrate the unceded territories that our universities are located on. By October 4th, 2020, I would like to see a Maple League-wide event for the National Day of Vigils for Sisters in Spirit. We need to have an ideas-based course on reconciliation held across our institutions. We've done it before, we can do it again for this. We should have an annual Indigenizing the Academy conference with Indigenous speakers from coast to coast to coast. Everybody's voices matter, and they all have different things to say. We need to have Indigenous advisors, counselors, and elders and residents yesterday. We need them on campus so, we, so Indigenous students have somebody to talk to. Indigenous student centers are also important because Indigenous students need to know they have somewhere they can go that's a safe space. Bishops has just invested in a new one. Who's next? We need to have scholarships for Indigenous students if we want to encourage Indigenous students to be coming to our universities. This is another form of reconciliation. We need to hire Indigenous scholars if we want to teach about Indigenous issues. A Canada Research Chair on each one of our four campuses is a necessity. And when we teach about Indigenous issues, it needs to be diverse, not regional. We need to listen to voices from Indigenous peoples all over the country. And finally, we need to have a cultural competency course for all faculty, staff, and administration to take to decolonize themselves, but we also need a mandatory course for all students to take because we need to make changes. Now, decolonization is going to take time. It's not going to happen all at once. But if we're serious and we actually want to make changes, we need to follow through. These calls to action are what I think needs to be done. This is a starting place. Let's start here and let's see where we can go together. If we're serious about change and we want to transform together, we need to get comfortable with being, discom with being uncomfortable. As Senator Murray Sinclair, the chair of the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, education is what got us here. Education is what will get us out. So what are we going to do? So Natalia. Our next speaker, Noah Lema Lubendo, is a 21-year-old African-Canadian born in Montreal to refugees fleeing conflicts in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. His immediate family moved to Vancouver in 2004 and has lived there ever since. Today, Noah is an undergraduate student studying political science and sociology at Mount Allison University, where he is co-president of the Black Student Union. He hopes to be a published author in the near future before pursuing a career in public service. Please welcome to the stage, Noah. What's crack a Listen closely if you please, but do so knowing I speak every word in my second language. The first I found too romantic to articulate colonial damage. Man, c'est la vie. 
I speak truth with kin tombs and forced dichotomy in the hopes Leopold's chocolate and dead double Dutch can set us free. Mais c'est la vie. I dream in broken Swahili. My skin says Jambo and my assimilation pretends it's never heard the word. I'll search for the meaning no colonizer could ever blur. Bonjour, hello, Jambo. My name is Noah Lemma Lubendo. I was born in Montreal. My mother is Rwandan. My father is Congolese and combined they survived two civil wars and a genocide. Today, my brothers and I are the fruits of their survival. I begin with this to set the tone. Diversity as we know it today is not made in a vacuum. Diversity in industrialized nations is too often a direct consequence of colonial institutions which have historically exploited, displaced, and massacred people of color. For example, Without the colonization of Africa and the subsequent bloodshed it caused, I would not be on this stage speaking to you in this tongue about what white men call diversity. Despite this, political discourses regarding reconciliation often focus on symbolism and representation rather than addressing the inequalities caused by the, ne by the colonial period in the first place. Welcome to neocolonialism. Now, before telling you a story about myself, I'm going to give you context using this little guy. Who here has a smartphone? Raise your hand. Cool. Keep your hand raised if you know what Tantalum or Colton is. All right, lot, like less hands. You notice that? All right. For those of you who don't know, Colton is a conflict mineral used in all commercial technologies, from phones to tablets to laptops. Without the mining of Colton, technology as we know it today would not exist. 80% of the world's Colton is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, a state defined by the hardships of its colonial past. Now, I'm going to I'm spare you a history lesson because, you know, it's the middle semester and uh, I had papers due last week. But I must note that as academics, thinkers, and dreamers of the tech age, it is our responsibility to be aware of the bloodstains that accompany our technological advancements, to be blunt. International corporations and consumer demand for phones, tablets, computers, and the like are implicated in the most lethal conflict the world has seen since World War II. Since the beginning of the Congolese Civil Wars, more than five million people have died. At its height, war in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo killed 73,000 people every month. Violence aggravated by the Colton industry is ongoing in Congo to this day. That same violence is the reason why my parents, along with my brothers, fled their home. That same violence is why I was born a Canadian. Diversity is not made in a vacuum. Using myself as an example, diversity is a direct result of globalized exploitation. Unfortunately, this is why I hate diversity talks and symbolic conversations about representation or inclusion. They fail to address the deaths that are forced onto us. They fail to acknowledge that I am a real person. Now, moving on, sorry. I must, I must make sure that you are aware that the trends that we look at considering the resource exploitation of Colton and Congo are directly related to a history started by King Leopold II in 1885. King Leopold II was an old monarch of, the, of, the, of Belgium. In 1885, from, from, from 1885 to 1908, King Leopold II exploited rubber from the Congo, enslaved all of its peoples, killed upwards of 8 million people to drive the global bicycle industry. Today, the same thing is happening with Colton and our phones. Things have not changed, the means have. Now, I've struggled with how to articulate the gravity of this for quite some time. My parents don't go, usually stand in front of um, rooms of white people and tell them that their buying habits are killing people that look like them. But things are serious, so you will be made aware. <clears throat> As a student in private school living in government housing, I was taught of the differences, the cost of my differences. My teachers made me aware that being loud and black would warrant a punishment. My peers taught me to laugh at the racialization of my humanity. My uniform taught me to conform. Being one of only black students in high school 
taught me that diversity depended on the subordination and policing of my identity. Growing up in government housing taught me very much the same thing. I often go to sleep to the sound of police sirens. I learned that gentrification is more than an academic study, and I learned to lie about the size of the two-bedroom apartment that I call home. As a student at Mount Allison University, I learned to assimilate into Western thought and pretend John Locke has any good ideas. He doesn't. I, he doesn't. I learned, I learned of, the, of the invisibility of the black academic. I learned that my eloquence comes as a surprise. Why is that? It's a question we don't ask nearly enough. Why is it that an eloquent black man is confusing? Or a question mark? You probably know. You've seen it. You are racial inequality in a lot of ways. Moving on. A few months before I went off to university, my brother pulled me to the side and told me something that I'll never forget. He pointed to the projects we live in and said, Noah, if we dare to be average, we'll be stuck here forever. He didn't say if we give up. He didn't say if we mess up. He didn't say if we fail. He said if we are average. There's a cruel reality behind his words. Average does not help you succeed in a world designed without your humanity in mind. Average does not get you out of the projects. Average does not make a home out of a penitentiary. Average does not bring a black boy who sleeps to sirens to university. Neocolonialism has effectively made class mobility a fever dream. One that we chase nevertheless because our parents did not survive all they did so that their children could wonder where their next meals come from. Now, you all have a responsibility. It is our consumer demands that displace millions around the world, be it through oil, coltan, cobalt, or whatever you want to name. We are displacing millions, and when they come here, we do not give them the resources to succeed or to realize their passions or their views on equality or diversity. What I mean by this is that diversity in Canada is an appendage of the very same notions that justify racially driven economic disparity and the disenfranchisement of indigenous people from coast to coast. Diversity in Canada is predicated on whiteness and the violence it imposes on non-white peoples. What is diversity? to ideologies with cultural preferences. What is ideology in a province that enshrines religious discrimination in law? What is diversity in a country with both metropolises like Toronto and reserves? We are not addressing inclusion. We are talking about symbols. I am not a symbol. My skin is not a symbol. I will close the same way I began with a poem. I found resilience walking to elementary school wearing fake Timberlands, athletic shorts without pockets, and a shirt with exactly four holes in it. One by my left armpit, another which I cut where a seagull gave me some good luck. The next to the bottom of right sleeve and the last helped the sun greet my heart in the morning. I found resilience in the shades of brown, the star gifted my ancestors, the rhythms I could bop to, and the mountains singing the sandcastles taught my voice to carry. I found resilience and the ghosts of familiar strangers. Mama made us watch Hotel Rwanda like Don Cheeto told her story and she'd be in the next scene. I remember the look on her face. Mine was full of surprise. Hers told me she recognized the smell of blood. Back then, refugee was just a name for something. Genocide was a fancy word. Machetes looked kind of cool, but I knew what hurt looked like. It looked like gasping for your happiness. It looked like a mother surrounded by three of her four, strun, surrounded by three of her four sons stranded on an island the size of colonialism. It still does. I found resilience drenched in the sacrifices of others. My DNA is compiled of victims I will never meet. I am a walking war memorial, a black sheep tribulation forgot to slay on the altar. My skin screams we were here, my bones hold all I own, and I love all of me. How could I hate all that the unheard dead have blessed me with? Inclusion can save lives. Apathy will surely kill. Thank you.
Our next speaker is Dr. Karen Blair. Dr. Karen Blair is an award-winning professor and scholar at St. Francis Xavier University, where she is an assistant professor of psychology and a Jules Léger research chair in humanities and social sciences. She has more than 30 publications, 14 invited addressees, including international keynotes, and was awarded the Outstanding Faculty Teaching Award this past spring at St. FX. Her work focus on, focuses on intergroup relationships and health, including LGBT communities, hate communities, and that of mass shootings. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Karen Blair. Over the past year, I've been the target of an online cyberbullying attack. This attack grew in its intensity, rather ironically, right as I was about to embark on a two-week Holocaust study trip this summer. While I was sitting on my plane in Toronto, ready to fly off to Berlin, my Twitter feed was blowing up. And it was blowing up with some of the most hateful messages. I've somewhat censored the ones that I'll share. But basically, they were asking me how I could be so stupid, saying that I was a disgrace to my field, that they would destroy me, and that they were coming to get me. They said I was a soul eater. I'm not sure what that one is. They said that I was living evidence that universities had become cesspools of brainwashed liberal ideologies. So I don't know if there's a ideal or perfect or proper state of mind that you're supposed to be in when you're about to embark on a Holocaust study trip. But I'll tell you that the state of mind that these attacks left me in made me all the more cognizant of the power of words. Because I think, well, I hope, that we know that the Holocaust began with words. It's a phrase that's been uttered by so many that it's difficult to attribute the phrase to any one person anymore. But I know that I have never met a Holocaust survivor who didn't in some way share this message as part of their story. However, I'm worried. I'm worried that we do not fully understand what this phrase means. When I began teaching about the Holocaust, I assumed that this number meant the same thing to everybody that it means to me. However, it turns out that I was wrong. A recent national survey in Canada found that 62% of Canadians between the ages of 18 and 34 could not correctly identify 6 million as the number of Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust. Things didn't get much better among Canadians over 35. And in my own research at St. FX, where I've been following the Holocaust knowledge of second-year psychology students for the last three years, things are only marginally better with one-third being unable to identify this number from a multiple-choice question. In fact, over 10% selected a number of 100,000 or less. This is what 100,000 dots looks like next to 6 million dots. It's off, and it's off by quite a bit. But what do students know? Well, they know that the Holocaust is an event that took place during World War II, or at least one of the World Wars. They know that it involved Germany, the Nazis, Hitler, and the Jews. Very few are able to name any other concentration camp other than Auschwitz, and very few can name a survivor other than Anne Frank. They lack a basic understanding of the chronology of events that made up the Holocaust, and even more so, they lack an understanding of the precipitating events that made the Holocaust possible. Further, the less Holocaust knowledge they have, the less likely they are to be offended by Holocaust denial, and the more likely they are to be supportive of alt-right ideologies. All of this taken together concerns me, and I think it should concern you too. But why? Why should we really actually be so worried that our knowledge of a historical event that took place 80 years ago is declining? Well, I argue that Holocaust education gives us a roadmap, the roadmap that we need to navigate uncertain times right now and that we will need again in the future when we meet more uncertain times. But how will we do that? How will we do that if we lack an understanding 
of the basic elements that made up the Holocaust and that made it possible. If we don't have that information, how will we live up to the promise of never again? Right now, we're standing on the bit of a ledge of a new frontier in Holocaust education. We're standing at a time when very soon, it will no longer be possible to bring in living, breathing Holocaust survivors to speak to our students. And this has served as a cornerstone of Holocaust education for decades. As the Washington Post recently put it, as the last Holocaust survivors depart amidst a surge of anti-Semitism, racism, and hate, who will tell their stories? I would add to that, who will know the importance and relevance of their stories? So today, I'd like to share with you four ideas that I have for future-proofing Holocaust education and ensuring that we will be able to live up to the promise of never again. So, if fewer than half of Canadian adults can correctly identify six million from a multiple-choice question as the number of Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust, something about that number isn't resonating. Because if you truly feel the weight of that number, how could you ever forget it? Perhaps it has something to do with how we are teaching about the Holocaust. Maybe we are allowing ourselves to slip into the standards of just focusing on numbers and dates and names and places. To demonstrate this, I'd like to tell you about one historical event in two different ways. And I'll let you be the judge of which one you think might be more powerful and which one might be more memorable. On October 16, 1943, the Germans in Rome, Italy, went through the Jewish ghetto and rounded up over a thousand people. They took them to the nearby military college where they held them for a couple of days, and then they shipped them north to Auschwitz where the majority of them perished. That's one way to tell the story. It's accurate. This is the second way. This is Rina Diveroli and her brother Adolfo. Rina was born on October 2nd, 1933. She loved to go to school. She went to an all-girls school and she did quite well. She liked to draw flowers and these are actually flowers that she drew. On the morning of October 16th, 1943, Rina went outside to play with her neighbor. And while she was doing that, the Germans showed up at the door to her apartment and ordered her mother and brother to pack up. Her father was not home at the time. The neighbor's mother noticed this happening and urged Rena to follow along because she didn't want Rena to become separated from her mother and her brother. And so Rena did follow along. And together they ended up in that military college where they were held in a crowded space with little access to water or food for two days. They needed these two days because they had to sort out who they had rounded up that might not be Jewish and make sure to let those people go. But once they were sure that everyone left was Jewish, they took them to the main train station in Rome. Perhaps you've been there. I've, I've been there. But it was different. And when they got there, they were loaded onto cattle cars. And they were filled up so that there was no space to sit, no space to lie down. And for a number of grueling days and nights, they traveled this way with no water, no food, no way to relieve themselves until they arrived at Auschwitz. And when they did arrive at Auschwitz, Rina being 10, Adolfo being eight, and their mother Vonda, 29, they didn't stand a chance of entering the camp. They were taken directly to the gas chambers. Along with Rena's maternal grandmother, Rosa, they all perished that same day that they arrived. Giacomo, Rena's grandfather, was likely admitted into the camp, but he too eventually perished. So Rena is one story of six million. Adolfo is two. Vonda is three. Rosa and Yakoma are four and five of six million. Of the 1,023 individuals who were taken from the Rome ghetto that day to Auschwitz, 16 survived, 15 men and one woman. So this is the story of one. 
And I hope that you'll see that this story, this version, was much more powerful. And when we start with these individual stories, that's the only way we can ever come close to the six million holding the weight that it does. And that six million also includes more than one million children, like, like Rena and Adolfo. But Holocaust education is not just about history. We need history. If you're a historian, we need you. We need historical context. We need historical accuracy. These are both very important. But Holocaust education needs to show up in all of our classrooms. It's relevant to so many different topics. There's the obvious contenders like political science and international relations, English, literature, sociology. There's some less obvious ones as well. There's, uh, there's geography. There's architecture. There's molecular biology and the advances that we're making in things like gene editing that bring a whole new form of eugenics into possibility. And one of the areas that I have found most useful in teaching about the Holocaust to my students has been art. There's something about art that can tell us more than any written word or even any perfectly directed Spielberg film. There's something unique about art, in particular with Holocaust art, because while we have the stories of survivors who come to speak to us, we're missing the stories of six million people who didn't survive. And sometimes all that they left behind was a little piece of art. Often art that they risked their lives to make so that they could make that record and hope that one day we'd be sitting here looking at it. And so I've found art to be very useful in connecting my students to this story. And this leads me to think that Holocaust education needs to be interdisciplinary and it needs, whenever possible, to also be immersive, to the extent that immersive is an appropriate word when talking about Holocaust education. This picture here is a group of my students on a study trip, sitting and learning in the very place where the decision was made to murder the Jews of Europe. And that's a different experience than just reading about it. It's a qualitatively different experience to read about a massacre that takes place in a forest versus to stand there in that same forest, in the very same spot, to feel the same ground under your feet, to look up at the same sky, to see the same trees, and to watch them blow in the wind, knowing that they very likely might be exactly the same trees that were there during the event that you're learning about. So I think that there's a real important need for as much of this type of learning as we can possibly afford. There's also no such thing as monsters. Any Holocaust education must, of course, make victims central to the story. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't also learn about the perpetrators. If Holocaust education can be a map to navigating our uncertain times of now and in the future, what good is a map going to do us if it only tells us where to find the victims? We also need a map that's going to tell us where to find the perpetrators, but also what path led them to becoming perpetrators. In popular culture, we tend to portray Nazis as zombies, as monsters, as the embodiment of pure evil. But they actually weren't. They were human. They were just as human as you and just as human as me. One of the most profound things that I notice in my students as we learn about the Holocaust together is that at the beginning of the course, they always think that they're going to be the rescuer. Okay. Anyways, they think that if they had lived during the time of the Holocaust, they definitely would have rescued people. By the end of the course, they realize that at best they would have been bystanders, and at worst, with a great degree, degree of probability, they probably would have been perpetrators. If we want to understand the Holocaust as a roadmap that can help us with our own uncertain times, then we cannot give in to the temptation of seeing the Holocaust as a tragedy that was committed by other worldly beings. We must acknowledge the shared humanness between us and the Nazis that perpetrated the Holocaust. Yes, they enacted pure evil, but they were not. And I would extend this to say that we must also recognize the shared humanity between us and the Nazis that continue to be amongst us today. This brings me to my final point, which is that never again is now. 
Hashtag never again is now has become a controversial hashtag that people add to their social media posts when they want to make some sort of comparison between current events or current world leaders and the Holocaust. And it's controversial because to some, they see this as being inappropriate, that to do so is disrespectful and that it cheapens the memory of six million to make these kinds of comparisons. And I would agree that the Holocaust should never be invoked lightly. It must always be invoked with careful consideration and great deal of accuracy. However, never again is now. And I think that the difference between seeing this hashtag as controversial and seeing it as completely appropriate may have something to do with the detail of our Holocaust knowledge. If your understanding of the Holocaust begins and ends with the gas chambers, the concentration camps, and mass shootings, or even with mass deportations and ghettos, then I can understand why you would see these comparisons as being inappropriate. Because by and large, with a few exceptions, very few of the current events and world leaders that we have today rise quite to this level. However, if your understanding of the Holocaust is that it began with words, if it began by dividing us versus them, if it began by using words to write laws that would limit the freedoms of some, if it began by limiting and changing and altering the public narrative, then I think it's much more easy to see the relevance and accuracy of making these types of comparisons. Using words to divide our world into us versus them charts a path that can lead to the destruction of our very humanity. So yes, the Holocaust did not begin with gas chambers or with mass shootings, not even with mass deportations or limits on immigration. The Holocaust began by using words to, divine, to define us versus them. It began by using words to encourage the masses to scapegoat a minority and to blame that minority for their own misfortunes. It began by using words to write laws that took away the rights of some. It began by using words to write movie scripts, movies that millions of Germans went to go and see, that depicted Jews as despicable, dangerous. It also began with words that weren't said. It began with words outside of Germany that failed to welcome and to defend the Jews. In Canada, it began with the words of a politician who, when asked about how many Jewish refugees Canada could take in, the answer was, none would be too many. So never again is now. Never again is now is because we are still, and perhaps never stopped, using words to divide us versus them, to slander and to instill hatred. Never again is now because we now are able to spread that hatred through a medium that was supposed to connect us and make information more accessible, but is really helping us to spread hatred in all sorts of new ways. Never again is now because the same politics, the politics of me over we, the politics of make whatever your country is great again, the politics of us versus them, the same politics that made the Holocaust possible are sweeping the world one nation at a time. The Holocaust is now because tomorrow is the one year anniversary of 11 Jewish men and women being murdered in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, very close to here. Never again doesn't mean promising that next time around we'll blow up the gas chambers. Never again means promising that we will pay attention to the words that we're using, and that we will ensure that the words that we use aim to share more compassion than hatred. We can't allow the very last Holocaust survivors who are alive today to die without showing them that we understand the magnitude of the task that they've left to us and without giving them the confidence that we will live up to that promise of never again. Holocaust education can certainly provide a roadmap for navigating 
our uncertain times today and our uncertain times in the future. But if our Holocaust knowledge continues to decline at the rates that it is, we're not going to know how to read the map. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emma Kuzmik, a third year English and philosophy student at St. FX. Um, Emma has been engaged in the fight against sexualized violence on university campuses since her first year when she released a spoken word as part of the We Stand Together campaign. Since then, Emma has had the opportunity to work at the Antigonish Women's Resource Center and Sexual Assault Services Association, sit on the Waves of Change Advi Advisory Committee, and the Advancing Women's Equality Committee at St. FX's Sexualized Violence Prevention Committee. Please welcome to the stage, Emma Kuzmik. Oh, oh, okay. Mm, oh, I've already messed up. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So I want to start off by saying that I'm very honored to be here with all of you today, but I'm also incredibly nervous. The story that I'm sharing today is very personal, and because of that, my legs might be shaking a little bit. Um, so if you could all just kindly pretend that that's not happening, I would love that. But anyways, I'm from Ontario, and growing up, I knew that I wanted to go to U of T. It's not too far from home, I visited the campuses, I had the merchandise, and I just knew that I wanted to go there. I also play soccer though, so part of my decision was based off of where I'd be able to play. And in my final year of high school, I attended a showcase, and one of the people that came up to me wasn't even a scout, but an alumnus. And he was telling me about this small school on the East Coast and how they needed a goalkeeper. <laughs> I'd never even heard of it. And the coach reached out to me and he offered to bring me on a recruiting trip and I thought that I probably won't go, but it's a free trip to somewhere I've never been. So I visited in January. And the weekend that I was there quite literally changed my life because I remember as soon as I got back on the plane to go back to Ontario, I wished that it was bringing me back to X. The community there was something that I'd never experienced before and I wanted to be a part of it so badly. So, in my typical procrastinator fashion, I waited until the very last moment possible, and then I committed. And when I made that switch from going f from U of T, a massive school in a big city, to St. FX, a small school in a rural environment, that wasn't even the only thing that I was switching. Originally, and the people who know me now might find this hard to believe, but I planned on majoring in astrophysics. And now at St. FX, I'm an English major. I haven't looked at numbers in a couple years. <laughs> Uh, and I was making all of these huge switches and I was going to be up and away from home, away from my family and everything that I knew for the very first time and I was praying that I had made the right decision. And then I got to St. FX in August and it was the beginning of the hardest months of my life. When I was in high school, I didn't really do much of like the party social environment. Um, I'd never had a boyfriend, never been in a relationship, never even kissed someone, and I was kind of just very innocent coming into university. And then I got to St. FX, and I got to know my professors, I made a bunch of friends, I started making my own food in meal hall, I loved all my classes, I started going to parties and being social, and I also got raped. And then I completely folded in on myself. I stopped paying attention in class. I stopped speaking up. This is the shaking that I was talking about. I stopped speaking up. I started drinking almost every day, despite not being allowed to drink during soccer season. 
I stopped eating, I started throwing up, I ruined some really close relationships to me, and I was basically just self-destructing in every way. So that was tough. And that was the first couple of weeks of October. And that month was hell. Because a couple weeks later, I was in study hall with my teammates, and I got a phone call from my mom that my best friend was in the hospital, and we weren't sure if she was going to be okay. And so I flew home the next day. That, I took that phone call, and I was just in a daze, and I left study hall sobbing, and I told all my professors that I'm not going to be able to come to class. I have to go home immediately. And they all understood completely without even asking why. One of them actually drove me the two hours to the Halifax airport. And I got home, and I spent the next few days in a psych ward, which is a horrible place to spend time. They're really not very cheerful. And it was so heartbreaking to be there and to realize that when I was going back to St. FX, she would be staying there for a little while longer. And while I was waiting in the airport to go back, I got another phone call, and it was from my friends at school because one of my other friends had been raped by two of my friends. And it felt like my heart just kept on breaking. And in the meantime, I kept pushing my trauma further and further away from myself so that I could extend myself for others. And my friend's case went public. And <laughs> so I get back to school, and my soccer team took action almost immediately in develop developing a campaign called Stand Effect Strong with the slogan, We Stand Together, End Sexual Violence. One of my teammates developed the logo, and it was shared all over social media by what seemed like the entire campus community. It was printed on buttons, st stickers, and t-shirts and that I still see all the time two years later. And I get back to school, and I really couldn't focus. And that next week, my women and gender studies class was talking about sexual assault on university campuses. And I remember feeling like I already knew enough. This wasn't a class that I wanted to be paying attention to, and so I didn't. And let me just say that my women gender studies professor is the most badass feminist that I've ever met in my life, and she does not typically let not paying attention fly, but she also knew to an extent what was going on in my life. And so while I was scribbling in my notebook, she kindly pretended that I was taking notes. But what I was actually scribbling was a poem. And it was about rape and about everything that had happened, and I couldn't focus on anything else. So after that class, I stayed behind, and my professor came up to me after, and I apologized for not paying attention in class, and then asked if I could read her the poem that I wrote instead of listening. And she said that she would love to hear it. So I read her the poem, and her positive feedback meant the entire world to me, and it gave me the courage that I needed to go forward with an idea. So I left that classroom, and I edited the poem a little bit. And then I went to my friend who had a video camera and knew how to edit, and I messaged a couple of my group chats to come to a specific location at a specific time, and in a few hours, I had a video. I watched it by myself in a room way too many times, and then I uploaded it to YouTube, shared it on my social media platforms, and shut my laptop. I'm going to share that video with you all now. I used to wonder when the simple act of walking home made us so small and wonder why she feels the need to pretend to make a call to her fake boyfriend and wonder why this fake boyfriend has been used so much and wonder when these questions will be pulled back up from under the rug and wonder when they respect our nose more than the idea of being someone else's possession and wonder when bringing this up will create more than just tension and then I began to wonder why it was that him having drank too much makes it okay? And why when she does the same, we tell her that, well, she shouldn't have drank so much anyways. And wonder when we will finally start to shift the blame. And now, 
I wonder if you felt her heart break when you broke into her. I wonder if the halt of her breath ever made you wonder if maybe you should halt as well. I wonder if the impact of your fist on her skin had any impact on you at all. I wonder if hurting her ever made you hurt as well. I wonder if telling her that she was six years younger than your younger sister told you anything at all. I wonder if the strength that you used to hold down her arms made you feel strong. I wonder if it was a complete lack of appetite that fed into yours. I wonder if her complete inability to respond made you pause at all. All I wonder. I wonder why this has happened over and over, only right now seems large. I wonder why this fucked up justice system makes it so hard to come forward. I wonder when we started to take plagiarism more seriously than sexual assault. I wonder exactly who it is that makes that call. I wonder when this will stop. Almost as much as I wonder when we'll start to fight back. I wonder if we can raise our voices loud enough to finally be heard. I wonder when every single one of us will stand behind her. I wonder when the silence that's been established will finally be disturbed. I wonder if it is now. And so I shared that video, and then pretty quickly I started to get a lot of messages. Both of my parents called me, begging me to tell them that it wasn't about... I don't know if that was me. <laughs> Both of my parents called me, begging me to tell them that it wasn't about me. And so I told them that it wasn't about me. I told everyone that it wasn't about me. It was about my friends, it was about the movement, it was about everything. And pretty soon after that, I had reporters started to message me, and they were asking the same kinds of things. And I told them about my teammates, and about the campaign, and about everything that had led to it. And the video kept getting views, and all of a sudden we were in the National Post, on CBC, CTV, just about everywhere I looked. And <laughs> campus felt different. I was in my first year, but it felt like people were starting to know who I was. <laughs> I was walking to my classes and people would stop me and tell me how much my video meant to them. And I started getting approached by more and more people who were asking me to speak at these different events. And if there was a rally or a march, there was a suggestion that Emma should hold the megaphone. And <sighs> campus just felt different. And it felt like I had accidentally put myself in a position where I was an activist. And <laughs> that was a lot. And I was getting all of these messages and people asking me to come and speak and I didn't really know how to do that because at the same time I was still just pushing my own trauma further and further away. And I was never, never acknowledging that. And this cultural shift wasn't something that stopped in my first year. Because the next year, St. FX, had another public case of sexual assault. And the activist community once again rose up, this time under a name called X Resist. And there were marches, campaigns, um, there was even a time where we, I don't even know the right word to use here, but basically approached the president of the university with a megaphone at an open house event. It spurred movements at other universities and it felt like, once again, everyone was being able to come together in a way that was just absolutely remarkable, doing something that wasn't really possible at any other institution. And <laughs> still, I wasn't owning my own experience, and it became exhausting. Then I was asked to speak at a Take Back the Night event in Antigonish, and my creative juices were just not flowing. So typically when that tends to happen, I have this habit of looking at old notebooks for things that I used to write. And one of the things that I found was the very first draft of the poem that I wrote in my first year. And after I left that Women in Gender Studies class, I only made one real revision in it. But it was changing every pronoun in the poem. Originally, the poem was about me and my experience but the poem that I shared was about her and her experience, and I was tired of hiding behind her. So, at Take Back the Night, 
For the very first time, I owned my own experience, and it was something that I hadn't shared with my best friends or my parents, literally anyone in my life. And the first time that I talked about it was in front of dozens of people and a camera. And looking back, I recognize that that's because that's where I felt most comfortable. I was with the same people who elevated my voice in the first place, who made me feel like I had something to say and provided me a space where I was able to fall back. After I owned up to that experience, the full weight of the trauma finally hit, and I was not doing too well. But I was still part of this conversation about sexualized violence. And that was exhausting. And I think that it's the same for so many people who get involved in these communities of activism. Because we want to get involved in things that directly affect us. I got involved in the fight against sexualized violence because I was directly impacted by it. And it's the same for so many others, whether it's yourself or a family member, a teammate, a partner. These conversations are exhausting. They're re-traumatizing, and at times they can be so frustrating. But we have these communities of support. And that's what I realized is basically the only reason that I'm even able to stand here. Because my community of support helped me get through times that I didn't even think I'd be able to survive. It was my team, my coaches. It was everything that made me feel like I could take leaps and they would catch me. Because when I came from Ontario, I was switching from the idea of going, I was switching everything. I was switching everything that I wanted to do. I was taking such a massive leap into the unknown. And I fell so hard. And despite that, I would keep making that same decision over and over again. Because when I got lifted back up, it was on the shoulders of the strongest people that I know. In a community where I'm able to thrive through times that I didn't think that I could survive. And I am so thankful. I'm so proud of myself of my teammates, of my campus, of my community. Because when you have a community like that, it makes it a lot less scary to take leaps, because it's not so hard when you fall. Yeah. Our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Nurse. Dr. Andrew Nurse is a director of the Center for Canadian Studies and the Purdy Crawford Professor of Teaching and Learning at Mount Allison University. He is a contributing uh, editor to activehistory.ca and serves on the editorial boards of Findings and Acadianis. He lives in Sackville with his wife, Mary Ellen, and teaches courses on regionalism and Canadian studies. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Nurse. So this is a middle-aged talk, and I think that's kind of appropriate because I'm a middle-aged guy. I teach Canadian studies, and increasingly when I look at my class and I talk to my students, I find myself talking about things that I never thought I'd talk about. There's a whole bunch of things, whether it's the continued racialization of groups of people in our society, whether it's sexual violence, whether it's the marginalization of people of poverty. And I think about the problems that my students are going to have to deal with because the people of my generation didn't deal with them. One of the things that I never thought I would be talking about at this point in time in my life is the merits of education. And in particular, the merits of an education in the liberal arts and humanities. Because when I was a student, when I was an undergraduate student, these merits seemed self-evident. In fact, they were so self-evident that we might have challenged them a little bit. So what I want to do, just a couple of proviso to begin, is a little bit of a confession because I feel a little bit like an imposter. I actually teach in an interdisciplinary program. So I teach with social science and the humanities and the arts and science and commerce and all kinds of things. I think we live in interesting times 
And I'm going to talk a little bit about the oddity of trying to defend the humanities and liberal arts, something, as I said, I never thought we'd have to do. And even though I'm talking now, what I really want to do is to invite you to become part of a conversation about the character and nature of post-secondary education and post-secondary education in the liberal arts and humanities. I'm going to approach this in four ways. I'm going to go through it in four steps. I want to talk a little bit about the challenges that education in the humanities faces today. I want to talk about what we know about education and the humanities. I want to talk about the value of it. And I want to think a little bit, speculate a little bit about how we can and should respond to the challenges. And those challenges are manifest. We've seen a shift in the educational demography of post-secondary education, of people moving away from taking courses in the humanities, in history, in literature, in, in music, in the arts, in philosophy, in religious studies, and a movement towards STEM disciplines. More involvement in experiential learning, and we're not always sure how that works in the humanities and liberal arts, and an increasing concern about labor market integration. What do I do after I go to your, your university? How do I move to a job? What's the path that takes me there? And will my degree in English or history or, or religious studies get me to that point? And I've got to say a couple of things about this. I don't actually mean to disagree or to slam or to reject those kinds of concerns. I'm a parent and I ask exactly the same things. Right? When my daughter takes courses, when she enrolls in programs, I ask, what are you going to do with that? Right? In part because, well, if she's been on the payroll for a while, I'd like to move her off. But also because we're concerned about the future of our kids. Likewise, the expansion of students taking STEM disciplines is not something to be rejected. It's not something that we should say we have a problem with this because a lot of that shift in educational demography is occurring because young women are going into the sciences, into technology, into engineering and math, and that's a good news story. So whereas those students may, 20 years ago, have been sitting more in my classes, that was a product of the character and nature of the way in which people thought about gender and education at the time. And those young women are being the best feminists that we can have because they are taking the autonomy that a generation of activists have created for them and they are using it. And we shouldn't shoot them down for it. More concerning to me are the changing perspectives of conservatives. And okay, we don't like conservatives. I don't like conservatives. I actually got in trouble in one of my classes a few years ago because I, we were doing sort of political leaders of Canada and I had Justin Trudeau and I had Jeremy Singh and I had Voldemort. So, <laughs> right, right? what concerns me about conservatives is that conservatives used to be the leading defenders of the humanities. They used to be the leading defenders of the liberal arts. They would make the case for the value of that type of learning, that way of thinking, those texts. And we can disagree with some of the text, and we can disagree with some of the argument, but today's conservatives don't make that argument. They make the argument that education in the arts, in the humanities, is a bunch of liberal claptrap. That it's intensely politicized. That asking you to think is somehow me imposing my views on you. That asking you to read a poem is somehow the rejection of established order that suggesting that reading Thomas King is somehow a political plot to convince you to vote differently. And that's a concern. When every type of education you can possibly imagine becomes politicized and we no longer read the text, we no longer think about what King meant, we no longer wonder about Maxine Tyne's poetry, but we simply, or there's a discourse that chalks it up. Equally important to me, something that we need to address is the way in which the humanities and liberal arts have been complicit in processes of colonization, in racialization, in sexism and marginalization. A good example of that is the way in which indigenous people for an extended period of time were written out of Canadian history. Canadian history began with explorers. And indigenous people were a bunch of savages who for unknown reasons tortured Jesuit missionaries. One caveat among many in this, many of these processes, and this is, this is publicly accessible data, you can find it, I can pass on references if you want, and you don't need to, to 
think, oh, I've got to like look at all of this and remember all of this. I also want you to think about, I want you to, to convey the idea that these processes are uneven, that they proceed in different ways at different paces and have an odd regional unevenness in Canada. But I also think they probably have an odd unevenness at different institutions and for different people. So bear that in mind, overarching generalizations are difficult to make. So how do we respond to some of the challenges when people talk about the problems or reasons why you shouldn't take certain courses in university? The first thing I say is that education is good for you. There's something I never thought I'd say publicly because I thought everybody knew it. Education does a whole bunch of good things and this is not just me making this up. These are things that we can actually empirically demonstrate, that we can show connections and correlations with. The higher your level of formal education, and I know there are all kinds of different types of education. We use formal education simply because it's the easiest to measure. You can look at the number of years versus different types of education. So just using it just as an example, not saying it's the only type of education, formal education, the higher your levels of formal education, the more likely you are to vote and be civically engaged. The more likely you are to, to volunteer in your community, to think of your community as home. The higher your level of formal education, the more likely you are to coach the minor basketball team, to be at the clean up the park day, to go to the concert at the Cenotaph, those kinds of things. We also know, and we'll have a chance to talk perhaps more about this later, that the higher your level of formal education, the higher your income. Now there's a big qualification in this. There's a big gender division on that point. We do know that a young woman with a university degree has the same earning potential as a man with a two-year college diploma, right? So there's a, there's a distinction that we need to be involved, that we need to be aware of. And then finally, behavior. The higher your level of formal education, the more risk adverse you are, the more likely you are to obey the law, the less likely you are to commit a crime. And liberal education does really well. All education does well on these things. All education improves these things. But liberal education does particularly well. And again, this is publicly accessible. I'm not going to go through all of it. Just look at this line, for example. 73% of liberal arts majors strongly agreed that they had at least one professor who excited them about learning. That's the great merit of liberal education, that ability to reach out and to get people excited and to say, hey, do you want to go on this journey with me? Do you want to walk down this path? Do you want to engage in this conversation? And that's something that liberal arts education does in spades. Response number two. A lot of people, we've already talked about it, find the humanities, a lot of employers find the humanities produce exactly the type of skills that they are looking for. And report after report after report confirms this. If we look at the top kinds of skills that employers are looking for in today's workforce, we find there are things like collaboration, communication, problem solving, relationship building, the kinds of things that go on every day in a humanities-based classroom. And we find the other things, technical knowledge, for example, down the list. In terms of employment then, the types of competencies that are developed by a liberal arts education are precisely those competencies that are going to integrate people into the labor market. And here's a quote, same type of thing that illustrates the exact same point. The defining traits of top employers and top teams are not technical skills, but the very qualities developed in the humanities. Response number three. There is an intrinsic value to education, and this is a very difficult one to prove. There's an intrinsic value to education in the humanities and liberal arts, because it's not an empirical measure. It's very vague, and it's difficult to define. And so I talk about it this way. I ask the question, what would you wish for? If you were picking something for somebody else, what would you wish for them? If you were picking something for your friend or your child or a parent, what would you wish for them? Would you wish that they had read Maxine's po Maxine Tyne's poetry or not read Maxine Tyne's poetry? Would you wish that they had read Ellie Weissel's Night or not read Ellie Weissel's Night? Would you wish that they had heard Leonard Cohn's music, say Democracy in the USA, or not heard it, or seen Carl Beam's paintings, or Daphne Ojig's paintings. 
If you were picking for somebody else, would you expand their cultural horizons or lower their cultural horizons or leave them the same? And when we ask that kind of question, very few people I've ever talked to said, you know what? I want my children to know less history. I want them to know less ethics. I want them to know less about world religions. I want them to know less about the types of music and poetry and painting that animate society. Response number four comes from my talking to my students. One of the things, I teach one of those big lecture classes, Introduction to Canadian Studies course, and a lot of students use it for a humanities distribution credit. And I ask them, why are you in my class? You have lots of choice. There's other classes you can take. You have chosen to come and to sit in my class. You're going to spend $800, a little bit more, to sit there. Why? And there's a whole bunch of reasons why students sit in my class. Some of them sit in my class because it's two days a week. Right? I had a young man ask me to override the cap. The course has a limit in the number of students on it. He explained to me he liked long weekends. I said, it's not really a good enough reason, sorry. Right? A lot of people take the class because it's in a particular time slot, right? Okay, I've got labs in the afternoon, I'll take your course in the morning, or I've got labs Tuesdays and Thursdays, and yours is Monday and Wednesday. And a lot of people take the course because, well, they just didn't know what it was, and they picked the, checked the little box on an online thing, and they ended up there. But a lot of people take the course for a whole bunch of other reasons. And when I ask students, why are you in my course? Right? Why are you here? What are you doing here? They talk about education in a way that defies the stark distinctions between STEM and the humanities, or between, say, commerce and the liberal arts, that occupy our heads, that affect the way we think, that we think of these things as different. My students don't seem to. One of the things my students say is, you know what, I'm a third-year psycholo third psychology major, I'm a third-year physics major, I'm a fourth-year biology major, and you know what, I'm really happy with my knowledge of psychology. I love taking physics courses. I feel really good about the commerce courses and commerce program I'm in. But what I don't know are the kind of things that you're going to talk about in your class. And as I go to graduate, it occurs to me that these are some of the things that I probably should know about that they think on a continuum about public policy, about public expression, about civic engagement, about culture, about coaching, about athletics. So students see the humanities as part of an education of, that has a continuum of meaningfulness, not stark distinctions, and that combines things that are often counterposed against each other. What about colonialism? What about the qualifications? We do live after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. And this is an important consideration. As we talk about the vitality and importance of the humanities, of the liberal arts, of the creative and performing arts, we need to be very, very careful that we do not replicate the problems of the past, that we don't write history in ways that consign indigenous people to the dustbin that we think about the character and nature of immigration history, that we have our students read about those things, that we have them th think about ethics across cultures. We need to be careful, in other words, that we don't use our justification of teaching the liberal arts and humanities as a way of ignoring, of silencing, of displacing the very voices that we need to embrace as we go forward. So where does this leave us? Well, it seems to me that it leaves us in multiple places. It leaves us with the need to f further a conversation. And I recognize that in the last year, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of voices pushing back against the idea that what students should be studying is STEM or commerce or something like that. And I want to be part of those voices, not because I want to reject STEM and I want to reject commerce, because I want them to be part of the conversation about that continuum. I want to engage that subject, and I want to invite you as we go to engage it too. So I think it leaves us, one of the places that it leaves us is a need to further and continue a conversation. Another place it leaves us is a need to ask questions. And one of those questions that we might ask is, how did we get to this place? What's gone on in our society? 
We can look at the political dynamics. We can look at the economic dynamics. We can look at the social and cultural dynamics. We might ask if we want to avoid the problems and pitfalls of the past, of the marginalization and racialization that infused the culture of Canada. We might ask, how did I, Andrew Nurse, a white, anglophone, middle-class man, get on this stage? Why am I here speaking to you and not somebody else? We might also ask, how do we broaden our teaching of the humanities? And a lot of people are doing this already. One of the things I love about the humanities are voices like Alfred's in Peace, Power, and Righteousness, right? Are, are, are the poetry of Maxine Tynes and the poetry of Rita Joe. The way in which David Adams Richards catalogs and explores the dynamics of poverty on the Miramichi. Or a film like Margaret's Museum asks us to think about what are the problems of toxic masculinity in the workplace and how does that become self-destructive. When I think about people like Marie Batiste or the late Richard Wagamese's Indian Horse, I see people from different perspectives, from different cultures, using the tools of the humanities to speak into our society. And that's the very conversation I'd like to ask you, invite you to participate in. Thank you. So that concludes our TEDx Bishop Sue for this afternoon. On behalf of my two co-hosts, Rebecca and Sally, on behalf of our Maple League presidents, and our students, and our faculty, and all of our colleagues, thank you so much um, for being here and for listening intently and for listening with the willingness to understand and to understand more deeply. Uh, there were a number of threads that ran throughout this afternoon's conversations. One was hope. And another was that deep empathy of being able to see through other people's eyes to think differently than one thinks in order to go on thinking and seeing. Um, I want to thank our speakers in particular for demonstrating a quality of courage and a generosity of spirit that was humbling and inspiring. I'd like to thank them for giving us various roadmaps to go forward into the future, that we have calls to action, that we can challenge the actual in the name of the possible. I invite you to continue the conversations in the hallways, in the streets, in your classrooms, uh, and to move towards social action. We do have a reception afterwards. We will have our speakers available for any of the burning questions that you have today. Um, and Lara has provided us with a call to action that Lauren will be distributing at the door. Um, if you want to engage, please send me an email, Jessica Riddell at Bishops. Um, dot ca, <laughs> you bishops dot ca. Um, I'm also the executive director of the Maple League, and we are open always to building in social purpose to our vision, and that's part of our guiding values. So please engage, act, and continue the conversations. Thank you.